So um, <clears throat> thanks everyone, I'm glad to be here. So my name's Aikud Ryder. I'm gonna speak with Jorge about data text and sports and natural language generation. Um, I think about questions, probably best to have them at the end after both of us speak. Maybe we can take questions, I think is um, our preference. So just a little bit about myself. So I have two hats. With one hat, I'm an academic, where I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, where I've been working on natural language generation like forever, <laughs> feels like. Um, and I'm also chief scientist of ARIA. Uh, ARIA actually basically essentially started a spin out company out of my research group, although it's grown much bigger since. Um, so I have a commercial hat and academic hat. And what's fun is that in actually both roles, I'm involved in sports and natural language generation, so it's, it's, which is kind of cool. And if you want to know more about me, I have a personal webpage at um, ahidwriter.com. So the plan is I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes, just give an overview about data to text. Um, and, and then and I'll talk for about 20 minutes. And Jorge will talk specifically about some of the really exciting stuff which we're doing at Area Boost. And so I'll talk about what is the what do, what do I mean by data to text? What are some of the technologies that we use? And I thought I'd also bring some of my academic work because I'm a, partly an academic. Talk about some work we've done on um, errors and um, neural sports stories and NLG. Okay, so I'll get going. So the first question is, I said I do not do language generation and data to text. Well, you might say, what is that? <laughs> um, so natural language generation, I see most people have heard of it. It's basically software which produces language. So you produce text in English, German, Chinese, whatever. They might be summaries and explanations of data, might be summaries of conversations and documents, might be jokes, novels, whatever. So there's quite a variety of different things that fall under the umbrella of, of NLG. And what I'm going to talk about here, which is my special interest, is data to text, which is producing text from data, from non-linguistic data. So for example, we've taken uh, numerical weather data and produce a weather forecast. Or we take an electronic patient record and produce a summary of what's going on with that patient, um, a written report. Or we've taken financial spreadsheet, you know, profits, losses, sales, and produce some kind of financial reports. Or Best of all, we take in sports data and produce some kind of sports story, is what we'll talk about today. All right, so I'm, I'm also involved a bit in other kinds of NLG, but I'll focus here on, on data to text. So I find it easier to explain data to text by giving examples. So this is a, uh, a weather forecast, which is one of the simplest examples of the technology. This is from a system which ARIA built around 10 years ago for the UK Met Office. Um, and what I like about here is you can actually see the data in the text. So the data is here. This, the rows at the bottom say that at 100 hours, that's a location, which is Heathrow Airport. Uh, it's nighttime, no rain, temperature is four degrees, wind speed is four miles per hour, et cetera, et cetera. So going on for about, I don't know, 20 or 30 different columns. And that's at 100 hours. Then 300 hours more data, and so forth and so on, right? So you can see we have the input data is just weather parameters at this point in space over a day. And so the natural language generation system takes that data and produces sunshine from mid morning into the afternoon, staying dry but becoming cloudier from early evening into Thursday. It's likely to feel milder than on Tuesday, the maximum temperature during the afternoon between 11 C, and then temperature overnight around 6 C, light winds throughout. Okay. We've taken this data here and produced this. For example, we've taken the wind speeds, which is four knots, four knots, and it stays pretty low, and said light winds throughout. That's the concept. We have lots of data, mostly numbers, some symbols like visibility, and we produce um, words to describe, to describe the weather. So that's a very simple example. Um, a more complex example, this is a system that we did actually at the university um, before we set up our it's just going back quite a ways, quite a ways. We work with a neonatal intensive care unit in a local hospital. Uh, so here we're working, these are bit where the patients here are babies. You can actually see the baby in there. She's teeny. 
it's a premature baby, maybe born two months early, uh, two months early. And so the baby has to stay in the hospital more or less until it reaches the birth age. Um, so while it's in the hospital, it's being here, it's in the incubator with oxygen, lots of sensors, nurse watching over the baby and a computer screen. So in this context, what we did is we took data from the baby. So we took sensor data. So heart rate, blood oxygen, blood carbon dioxide, et cetera, et cetera. And we took action data, changing the amount of oxygen in the ventilator, giving the baby morphine. And from these two data sources, these two input data sources, we produce summaries to help doctors make decisions about how to treat the baby. So here's a short excerpt from one. It's very technical, so I won't read it, but you know, it, this is the kind of thing doctors want to see. We also produce text for nurses uh, for shift handover. So a nurse came up the shift. She knew what happened, what had happened the previous shift and for parents, okay? So in this case, we're taking quite complex data, time series data and event data, and then turning that into summaries about the baby um, for different audiences. So that's the idea of data to text, right? You take in data and produce words in whatever language we're working in. Um, some of the popular use cases, weather forecasts. Actually, this was the very first usage of NLG and it actually started 30 years ago in 1992 when the very first NL, uh, data to text system went live in Canada to produce weather forecasts uh, for the Environment Canada. So yeah, it was, I still remember that 30 years later, it was very exciting. Um, business intelligence. So this is where we take in, you know, spreadsheets or databases, mostly financial data like um, profits, sales, that kind of thing, and then produce, um, you know, reports, insights to help people make decisions about the data. Uh, product descriptions. So this is where you take in uh, data about a product, and from that, uh, produce a description for an e-commerce site, and often multilingual. So this is kind of fun because often you want to do this. In lots of languages. The e-commerce site is selling in lots of places. Um, healthcare, as you just saw, and of course, sports. So I just want to say again, while I'm being very, very high level, one thing that we see across these use cases for data to text um, is that the goal is usually to communicate insights, right? So we're basically trying to get insights from the data and communicate them in words to a person. Um, why words? Because some insights are more easy expressed in words than in graphics. And also in words, we can show insights are related. In fact, another important thing about data to text is that what people always tell me is that they want stories, right? They say, okay, I don't want your insights in bullet points. I want them wrapped up into a nice story, a narrative, which shows how they all link together. And so that's, again, quite important in, in, in data text to try to not just have bullet points, but an actual story. The narratives must be accurate. I mean, in almost every use case I've ever worked in, people say, if the stories are not accurate, we don't want them. Um, so most um, customers have a very strong desire to have accurate insights about their data. And that's important because that's a real challenge for neural systems, which I'll get to in a few minutes. And then last but not least, um, when we deploy these systems, it's often in a human in the loop workflow. So for example, with weather forecasts, um, usually what happens is the software produces a draft forecast that a human forecaster takes a look at it and says, yeah, it looks fine, or maybe fixes it up a bit and then releases it. So sometimes the text are directly to users, but at least where I work, it's usually checked by a person first. Okay, and so what are the challenges that we see in building these systems? Well, I think Jorge is gonna talk about this for area boost in sports, but I just say, from my point of view, trying to be very generic, you know, requirements are always a challenge. What do people want? Um, because this is a new technology, people that don't really know it's possible. So it's quite hard to figure out what they actually want, what's gonna help them. Data, of course, as any kind of AI, data science, the data is a mess. It's noisy, missing bits, expensive, proprietary. So getting the data is a hassle. Evaluation, 
how do we test how good our narratives are? Uh, it's a real challenge and something I do a lot of on the academic side. How do we actually, how can we measure the quality of these texts we produce? Uh, testing, again, in a software sense, again, like lots of AI software, you know, because they're very complex and doing amazing things, can be quite hard to make sure they're robust in the edge cases. Um, so do software testing is quite a challenge. And support, again, as other AI systems, you know, the world evolves, um, the hospital brings in um, new equipment, um, the weather people change, the, the data they provide, you know, uh, whatever, the world changes, we have, we have to adapt our system as the world changes, and that's often quite difficult, as it is, of course, for, for many AI systems. Okay, so that, that was like very high level. So. Let me say a little bit about the technology, not a lot. I could talk for ages about this, but I'll keep this fairly quick and then hand over to, to Jorge, who'll talk about what, what, what ARIA does. But at a very high level, there's two ways of doing data to text. One way, we have a pipeline of stages. So we break up the process to a bunch of different stages. Um, we'll just go through the stages one by one. In each stage might be machine learning, might be rules, might be a mixture. Then the other approach is what's called an end-to-end -end approach, where you take a machine learning model, a transformer or whatever, uh, and we just train the model. We say, okay, here's the weather data, and here's the weather forecast written by a person. And then we, you know, we, we, we fine-tune a model, or maybe we use a, use a prompting approach. Um, but whatever, we, we train the model to do end-to-end -end from data to text with no intermediate stages. So the pipeline, um, actually it's probably easier to see with an example. So this is an example using the medical system I talked about, the one for premature babies. So here there's five stages in this system. The first stage is signal analysis, tr trying to figure out what's noise and what's not noise and looking for patterns. So here actually most of this is noise. So this thing here is noise because oxygen can now drop to zero, zero instantaneously. That's impossible. So this is just noise. That's just noise. That's largely noise. Uh, these things are real, right? These drops there are real. So we go through and say, like any data analysis, what's real and what's noise. Once figured out, yeah, this is real, uh, we then say, right, we've detected two downward spikes in heart rate. And that's the output of signal analysis. In data interpretation, we look at these patterns and try to interpret them in this domain. So these, it turns out that these things are what a doctor would call a bradycardia. So they, these aren't just downward spikes, they're bradycardias. Uh, and that's important to a doctor because a bradycardia tells them certain things about how the heart is behaving. Uh, document planning, we say, well, we've done all this pattern analysis. We have tons of patterns. What do we talk about? In this case, we say we're going to talk about these things because they're quite important but probably don't talk about this drop in temperature because that doesn't really matter very much. So that's kind of unimportant. It's real, but unimportant. This is really important. So we're gonna focus on this in our narrative. Microplanning, which is the actual words we're going to use. So again, this system could produce reports for parents as well as for nurses and doctors. The nurses and doctors, we talk about bradycardias. The parents would say spiking heart rate because parents don't know what bradycardias are. And then finally, realization is dealing with grammatical details like um, bradycardias rather than bradycardia. But anyway, that, that's, that's the pipeline approach. Right? We have these five stages or whatever. We go through the one by one, and it, you, in that process, go from the data to the text. Um, the, end, the, the neural end-to-end -end approach is, in contrast, says, okay, let's do it in one jump. Either we take a transformer or whatever, and we fine tune it on the corpus of input data and human narratives. You usually often use machine translation technology. So we treat it as a translation problem, but we're going from data to text rather than French. So we're going from, from data to English rather than French to English. We often use the same kind of a technology. Um, or more recently, we, we take a prompting approach uh, with a large language model like GP3 or Bloom. Uh, we can prompt it to generate the output. And let me just show you an example, because I think this is actually a great illustration of uh, the pros and cons of, the, of this end-to-end -end approach. So here I've gone to Bloom, which for those who don't know it, it's 
It's uh, kind of like GPT-3, but done by Hugging Face. And so here, I, I, so, so I told Bloom data, the Memphis Grizzlies scored 102 points, the Phoenix Suns scored 91 points, story the, and then I told Bloom, please complete the sentence. And they came up with, the Suns scored 91 points, beating out the Grizzlies for the win. So I hope you see two really important things about this Bloom Outbook, because they're absolutely typical. One is that it reads really well. This is very fluent. You know, the Suns scored 91 points, beating out the Grizzlies for the win. That's just the kind of language we want the system to produce. The language is really good. However, it's also wrong because the Suns did not win, they lost, right? The Grizzlies had more points than the Suns. So this is, this is very well written, very fluent, but it's factually wrong. Um, and that's in general what we see an awful lot of in this space. Um, the system produced stuff that reads very well, uh, but it, it, it's factually incorrect. Um, so yeah, so let me just, yeah, I have a few more minutes. So let me just say, um, as I said, just to finish up thinking, just to follow up this point about the mistakes and also talk about my academic work a little bit. Um, so, you know, we've seen things like this for a long time where the system, these neural systems and end systems make mistakes. So one of my PhD students um, has been looking in detail, trying to understand what kind of mistakes are made by um, these neural models when they do generate sports stories. So he's looked at mostly basketball, also a bit of baseball, mostly English, also looked at German. And he's run basically generated lots of stories uh, using different models in these different spaces and then tried to find mistakes in them. And what he does is when he finds mistakes, he says, okay, he characterize them as different kinds of mistakes, number errors, name errors, word errors, context errors, not checkable or other. And in general, by the way, um, there's good agreement, right? There's quite good annotator agreement um, about these errors. Except, I mean, sometimes, not always, but sometimes people disagree on what words mean, but that's unusual. And so here's an example, right? This shows you the kind of thing that Craig's been looking at. So this is a um, text produced by a neural NLG system. And first of all, again, it reads super good, right? If you actually read the text, Memphis Grizzlies 5 3 defeated Phoenix Suns 3 2 Monday. I won't read it out, but it, it just it reads really well. However, everything in red is a mistake. Um, so Memphis Grizzlies 5 to 2. It's actually should be 5 to 0, not 5 to 2. That's a number error. Defeated the Phoenix Suns 3 to 2 Monday. No, that should be Wednesday. We call that a name error, a name error. 102 91 at Talking Sticks Resort Arena. Again, that's incorrect. It should be US Airway Center. So that's another name error in Phoenix. Grizzlies had a strong first half. That's incorrect. It's actually a weak first half. That's what we call a word error, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see again, we saw what we saw with Bloom. The text reads really nicely, but it, it's full of mistakes. Um, and, and the one at the end, by the way, is interesting where we say, Mark Gasol scored 18 points, leading the Grizzlies. Isaiah Thomas added 15 points. So here, Isaiah Thomas actually did score 15 points, but he scored it for the other team, right? So it's literally true that he scored 15 points, but he scored them for the Suns, not the Grizzlies. And so we call this a context error because it's literally true, but it's very, very misfitting the context because when you read it, you think you played for the Grizzlies and he didn't. Um, and anyway, so, so Craig has done some stats on this and finds that on average, a 300 word summary produced by one of these neural end to end systems in, in sports has 15 to 20 errors um, on average, which is a factor of 10 higher than what we see in human sports writers. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of errors. Um, you also look, can we actually find these errors automatically? Um, and basically you can find the simpler ones you can kind of do okay, number and name, but the, but the more complex errors like word and context, you just really can't find them automatically. Okay, so I'll just finish up now because um, yeah, I want, to have, I want to talk about 20 minutes. I think I've kind of hit the 20 minutes. So in summary, just of this kind of stuff that um, Craig was doing, 
Um, the neural NLG systems generate sports stories that read great, but have lots of mistakes. Plot you have 10 more than human sports writers. Some of the things are hard to detect. So I think what we've concluded, again, is that it's a really exciting space, lots of cool technology, but um, you know, if you want to do it for real, at least now, it's probably not the right way to do it because it's just too many mistakes, even if with humor in the loop workflow. Okay, so that is me, and I will stop sharing the screen and then turn over to um, Jorge. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Jorge Costa. Uh, everyone uh, hear me? All right. Sound good. That is a yes. All right. All right. Let's see if I can get this thing started for you all. Um, thanks, Ehud. Um, I think what I would say about, you know, really the differences here uh, with Ehud's presentation and mine, um, it's really, uh, really talking about different applications uh, and, and sort of like what led us to the even possibility of using uh, NLG for sport. Uh, and really uh, building it through, okay, so first uh, use case um, insights, can we connect those insights? Can, can we make them fluid? Uh, can we have it present something that's uh, readable, uh, enjoyable? Uh, um, and so uh, hopefully I'll, I'll walk you guys through um, our process uh, and then we'll leave it up in two questions. So I'll go ahead and present here. Let's see if I can get this. All right. You guys all, you guys see that? That's good. Excellent. Appreciate it. So, yeah, uh, we tell stories. Uh, so, Aria Boost. Um, uh, I lead our data science, uh, science department. Uh, we put together the language models that produce content for sport. Uh, we've been doing this uh, for a few years now, and uh, we have a few uh, different uh, sports uh, implemented uh, as solutions in our offering. And I'll walk you through some of those. But um, I think the uh, for the purposes of this call, I, I think I think. Um, I'd like to walk you all through sort of like the challenges in, in producing sports content. And so um, a little bit more about me, uh, Jorge Acosta, my background is, is really in, always been in sport, uh, primarily in the NBA, uh, but now across different sports. Um, so NBA basketball, professional basketball in the US. Um, first at the NBA league office and then at the team level uh, for the Detroit Pistons here in Detroit, uh, where I am currently based. So I think, I think there's some uh, Ann Arbor folks here, uh, also originally from the East Coast, so New York, New Jersey area. Um, but yeah, uh, then uh, we, we started this, uh, this, this company boost that then uh, became acquired and, and now part of ARIA boost, um, doing uh, coaching analytics for, for college basketball. And in that, we found that uh, to bridge the gap to coaches, you know, uh, a couple of bullet points and sentences uh, are much more digestible than, you know, big spreadsheets. Uh, and that's uh, how we, we got into the NLG game and, and what got us here today. Um, so I think Ehud uh, mentioned it uh, first and foremost, uh, challenge number one, data. Uh, you're not going to do anything without uh, uh, good, clean, structured data. Um, you know, the data has to be accurate. Uh, the data has to be timely. Um, and for our purposes, uh, we find that uh, unless you have a good basis of historical data, you, you are very limited to the nuance, the context you can provide uh, to your readers and whatever use case you, you choose uh, when, when generating uh, uh, sports uh, content generated by uh, NLG. Um, and so I'll talk about accuracy a little bit, but, but that one's self-explanatory, right? Ehud mentioned it, yet some metrics. Uh, no one wants to read something that's not uh, accurate. So when you're placing a player of the wrong team, 
uh, as neural nets are currently doing. Um, yeah, that's it's a challenge. And so uh, I'll be totally frank that uh, I think uh, there are a lot of gains to be made still uh, with traditional language models, uh, uh, some rule-based models and some modeling uh, on the side to sort of put it all together and put really put together really nuanced sports narratives. Uh, and that's what we're doing today. Uh, timeliness, uh, I'll tell you that uh, if you're trying to produce uh, engaging content after a game, uh, you really want to get, whether it's SEO dependent or not, you really want to get that content out um, quickly after a game because sports content is kind of a commodity and it's kind of ephemeral. Um, you know, depending on the league, I'll tell you a good example. Uh, so uh, uh, English a Premier League uh, or, or for any other um, soccer or football, uh, leagues, um, teams will play at most two, two times a week, maybe, maybe three, uh, with, with different, uh, leagues being involved, uh, basketball, uh, American basketball, likewise, uh, NBA basketball, you're talking three, four, five games a week, uh, potentially over the span of maybe eight, eight, eight days, you can get five games, six games, um, sometimes. So, uh, if I produce a post-game recap, uh, it's going to be live. Uh, on some sort of medium, people are going to read it, and then it's going to be the next game. And so uh, it loses value rather quickly. So the faster you can get out, get it out, uh, the more value it has. Um, with different data sources come different delivery timelines. And so to produce a high quality sports uh, content via NLG, you have to be uh, really in tune with your data providers uh, and your data delivery. Uh, your SLAs, your, you know, unforeseen events. Uh, you know, we're talking about live sports here. So uh, anything that goes wrong, uh, any weather delays, for example, or a big one, um, your, your pipeline better account for that and your narratives better account for that. So these are uh, exceptions to the rule. You might have the, the best language model and, and tell the greatest story, um, but if it doesn't account for, you know, play stoppage, uh, you might uh, you might have an embarrassing result um, in the in the content you produce, and so um, going off of what Adahud said, uh, I think for us currently um, we're building to scale. We're building solutions sports specific, um, and so we're not really looking at a human in the loop. Um, so if, if if we remove the human in the loop. Um, for production uh, um, engagement, uh, your your language models are going to be pretty pretty performant. You're talking seconds to generate content, and so your biggest gap really to delivery is how quickly can I get the data in? Can I get the data processed? Uh, and so that that one's huge, uh, um, and I can go all day uh, on, on timeliness of, uh, of data. Um, the last thing I would say is uh, historical data. So you can produce a pretty good um, post-game report uh, with just uh, box score data, with just the data for uh, that encapsulates a single game. Um, but if you want to add nuance and context and trends, you better have some historical data. You want to at least have uh, insight into the previous games leading up to this game. Um, how's a player doing coming into this game? What are their averages? You know, those are the lowest hanging fruit. Um, you can talk about streaks. You can talk about winning streaks, losing streaks. The last time this happened, uh, you know, uh, um, broadcasters love to talk about the last time this happened here in this scenario. Really nuanced stuff. You can't do that unless you have a database of historical data. And and unless you've tagged that data in such a way that it's readily available for your language model to pull in. Um, so again, I could go all day about, uh, about data. Um, data has been, sports data has been my life for, for close to 15 years now. Um, and maybe, maybe if you guys have questions uh, afterwards, we can dive into that. Um, next one here is conditionals. And so, this is a, an NLP, NLG meetup. And so I don't, uh, I probably don't need to tell you what conditionals are, but this is really the engine of how we produce content. 
Um, so in sports, you have generalized sports scenarios. And those are our conditionals that uh, we can reuse across sports. So if a team is in a winning streak, it doesn't matter what sport it is, uh, a basketball team, a, a football team, uh, a tennis player, uh, if they're on a winning streak, that it's a, a globally accepted term, um, we're going to have that logic uh, and those models created. Um, sports specific scenarios are the, that's where the nuance comes in, right? Uh, uh, American football is going to be much different. Uh, the language around a game is going to be much different than, than, than uh, global football or soccer, right? Uh, and I think it would uh, touched on hallucinations. Uh, hallucination. <clears throat> so conditional uh, conditionals uh, done right really uh, really sort of like get rid of that challenge. But uh, the challenge is producing uh, good conditionals, and and so uh, I'll mention this later on in, in the slides. But um, identifying the sort of the complete scope of your conditionals is really the biggest challenge. Because um, you could have a client that comes in with a corpus and says, uh, okay, this is the sample narrative I want to recreate at scale. And we can say, okay, we'll break it down and say, well, um, that's, that's great in this scenario, but this scenario happens 5% of the time. Um, can we identify this scenario? Can we label it and then extrapolate uh, all the permutations uh, of that type of scenario where we have coverage uh, for all occurrences. And so this is, this is really the biggest challenge and, and the biggest area of creativity that we find in creating these language models for sports. Um, number three, um, co content and copy variations. I'll tell you candidly that um, engineers, data scientists, uh, people who build language models don't love creating copy. Uh, and it's it's probably uh, uh, it's probably no surprise, um, but creating copy is hard. It's, you know there are there are editors, there are writers, they do a very good job. And so to make uh, an automated system like ours produce a content of the same parity as a writer where you might you know not not be able to distinguish it, um, you're going to need a library of content uh, that really adds um, variation in such a way that uh, you know the repetition won't won't be readily apparent. And um, you know, frankly, it, it it needs to be something that's that, that's enjoyable to read. And I think I'll get that to that in the next slide. But um, copywriting is hugely important. Um, I think when you build something for scratch for sport. For individual sport, uh, we've relied on you know writers for that sport to really um, help and collaborate in creating a language model for sport, and we've had great success with that. Um, but yeah, the the ability to update and uh, make changes to this language model, I'll get to this as well, uh, is is imperative, right? Because there's going to be changes you're going to get. You know, someone who reads it and say, hey, we probably shouldn't say this, or I came up with a great variation, um, right? And so who makes that change to the language model? Uh, right now, with the technical resource, can it be a content person? Can it be a writer, an editor, who's maybe, maybe not as technically savvy, um, um, but, but who has great insight into the language they want to use? Um, so that's challenge number three. Number four is accuracy, and this is an easy one. You know, uh, the stuff has to be the stuff has to be spot on. Uh, you can't have players on different teams or or any uh, vagueness in, in who's doing what. Um, and also, uh, it's got to be it's it's got to be uh, insightful uh, for the sport. You know, if if there are if it's uh, I'll talk about soccer for a second. Or, or any sport, if it's a high scoring game and there's a player who scored a lot of the points, a lot of the goals, and we talk about, you know, uh, someone having one or two of insert stat here, one or two blocks, one or two steals, uh, and we prioritize that, um, you know, it's not gonna be, uh, we talk about accuracy and validation, 
it's not technically wrong, but it's not what you would expect to see. And sort of the nuance and validation uh, is important. Um, you know, even beyond uh, are all the variables in the right place and, and are things saying what you expect them to say, um, I think it's hugely important. Got it. Um, number five is uh, fluidity. Uh, so when you are providing insights, uh, bullet points, I think uh, you know you can get away with a lot. Uh, you can just rank them on relevance and uh, and off you go. But when you're creating maybe a multi uh, paragraph uh, piece of content, uh, uh, maybe it's three sentences together uh, providing a recap, um, you got to connect the theme uh, of your content piece, uh, and you have to have a a, a sentiment uh, that goes across. Uh, all your sentences, uh, all your paragraphs, your entire piece. And so that's hugely important as well. It's something we try to do uh, to produce engaging content. Um, and then lastly, avoiding repetition, whether it's re uh, readability, uh, whether it's making someone believe that uh, this is you know, a writer writing this, and not a, a program. Uh, uh, I think avoiding repetition is hugely important. And and some of you might know as, as SEO rules changes uh, with the Googles of the world, um, you are not going to get the best results with, uh, with you know, just templated uh, content. Um, so fluidity is important in that sense as well. Um, challenge number six, uh, and I would say integrations uh, are you know, a challenge across any industry, right? Um, customer specific integrations. Um, sorry, the, the, the comments are popping up here. We'll, we'll get to them. Um, yeah, customer specific integrations, right? Does your client um, have data that they want to uh, insert and use in your language model? Do they have uh, user data that they want to use for personalization? Uh, do they have specific content delivery needs? I think all those things uh, sort of, um, you know, besides the language model and that solution uh, are really make or break. And so you have to be flexible in that delivery method and you have to be able to meet your uh, clients uh, where they are. Um, so I could just expand on that uh, with questions, but again, hugely important. Let's see. And lastly, I, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but with talent, uh, this stuff is, is hard. It's, it's challenges. These are challenges, right? Um, so finding talented data scientists, engineers, and uh, even writers. Uh, you know, I talk about the blended team to produce a language model. Um, it's sort of like a, a weird dynamic for a writer to come in and say, okay, how can I help? And then we as you know, engineers, we as the scientists need to create a tool um, that, that sort of lets them uh, be the best at what they do uh, and understand how a, a language model tree works uh, and, and how we built it. So uh, hugely important here. Um, use cases, uh, we could probably elaborate on this a bit, but yeah, you have your game recaps, your previews, your team player trends. Uh, in-game events are interesting, um, and, and this goes back to your data. If you don't have a lot of data, this is a use case you can't really leverage. Um, and then social media, everyone's favorite, um, whether it's a tweet or, or something else. Um, the future, this is the exciting bit. So the future of NLG for sport. Um, and so as Aria, um, the, we do have a tool uh, to, to create content, LG content. I think the future of the industry is really enhancing the tooling to help non-technical contributors contribute to these language models, uh, to understand the language models and to sort of make edits uh, that are not technical in nature. Um, I think user level uh, customization is gonna be huge. Um, whether it's providing a dynamic content perspective. So uh, if we have a, 
user data user database and we're providing newsletters uh, and users have a favorite team or users have like a, a you know in the betting space uh, they have a last bet uh, for example or um, there's a, a multitude of teams they follow so you can tailor the the content uh, in that way to give them exactly what they need uh, and then it rearranges the text uh, to say instead of maybe going with a um, you know an AP style approach was where it's very neutral maybe maybe you don't want to be neutral maybe you want to be uh, biased maybe you want a certain level of flair in your content uh, and that's an avenue we can we can approach as well. Um, Ehud uh, mentioned this as well. So uh, um, as Aria Boost, so we started in basketball, we started um, um, producing content and, and analytics for coaches. And so we talk about data a little bit and the data that, that you use, um, sometimes you can generate your own data. And uh, what you're seeing here is sort of, um, computer vision derived data that we can use to augment the narratives uh, and to add an additional layer of context. Um, and we can talk a lot about, uh, about context because um, at the end of the day, um, the quality of the narrative really depends on how many different uh, data layers you can sort of put together to tell a compelling story. So in this example, it, it's just showing you the, the kind of data you can derive from computer vision. Um, we have player uh, number 14 detecting an action of a pass. You have the distance from the passer to the receiver. Um, and then you have the distance from the attacker to the defender. And so this can tell you, okay, that, that happens to be Kate Cunningham. Uh, number one draft pick for Detroit Pistons. And so uh, you can talk about different uh, um, defender distance for different types of shots, um, nuanced data that, that you're, you might not get anywhere else. Um, you can derive it. And this uh, gives you an example. Um, this really quickly as well to use computer vision, you need um, um, to marry sort of different data sets. And in this case, we're using OCR to pick up the uh, score ticker at the bottom um, and at the top you'll see a representation of what we're capturing there um, and so it, it lets you marry a play-by-play -play event based um, set of data uh, to the video or you can also grab that data and add it to your narratives um, and then these are the sort of narratives you can put together uh, uh, for social um, just to give you a, a um, if you're doing, you know, betting uh, style stuff that's uh, customized to to a user, um, maybe they're a UCL uh, UCLA fan, and we're talking about uh, what happened um, after the last game and, and how their 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 betting fared. Um, we could also do um, captivating headlines. Um, you know, how, how does the data know that um, the last shot of the game was a buzzer beater? We, we have a series of models that, that, that does, um, that captures that data. Uh, and then obviously something like that we would prioritize in, in our content. Um, but yeah, I think, I think just as an inter in the interest of time, uh, that's probably, that's probably where we are. Um, Seth, I, don't, I think we were okay on time. Yeah, we are. Um, you, you guys, uh, you gentlemen can go to questions and Q&A. You actually just touched, uh, Jorge, on the first one. Can this do image or video to text uh, just a couple of minutes ago? Uh, do you have anything further to say on that topic? And then after that, I would let you, got, uh, let you gentlemen uh, go through the Q&A yourself. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so um, can it do uh, maybe... So are we doing text-based questions uh, or can we elaborate maybe? No, no, there's a Q&A uh, box on, on Zoom. Yes, um, can you open up the Q&A box if necessary? I will, or Ehud or, Ehud or I will read that to you. Got it, okay, no, no, I'm here, yep. Yeah. I mean, I can say a little bit about that. So, I mean, this is not a captioning system, right? So there's obviously lots of technologies where you take an image and try to 
capture what's in the image, describe the image. This is more data, right? So what we do is we get the game data, get the videos, and extract from that key insights to communicate in the narratives. So we're not describing the image in any, any kind of complete sense. What we're trying to do is pull information out of the video stream, which helps us on interesting stories. Well, so actually, I would also, I would almost, uh, I would almost say yes, we can. Um, it's it's not the solution. It's not the 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 use case we um, we use the solution for. Uh, but it's a subset of the data. So you, yes, you could easily you could easily do that uh, to a certain extent. Uh, and I showed the example of the defender distance. And so if you freeze frame that and say, okay, for uh, if you're combining two things, so uh, Rutgers stuns number one Purdue at the buzzer, right? And so if we take that play and then pull up the computer vision derived data. So where were the players at that moment? Uh, we could say something about that and then translate the text, yeah. All right, so let me go on and say, there's a few for me and then there's more for Jorge. So um, Dirk asks about why are there no commercially available system data to tech systems in healthcare? Um, there have been a few. Um, they've all been quite localized. So within um, say a hospital or hospital group, um, or maybe it's just one manufacturer. So we see bits and pieces of data text used um, in, in commercial healthcare, but it is, it is very slow. Um, and it's just a difficult area, to be honest, it's a difficult area to, you can't move quickly in healthcare, right? So if you have a good product, say in sports or in financial reporting, you can move much more quickly than you can um, in healthcare, unfortunately, because I think healthcare is a great application area. There's a lot we can do, but it's slow to get things out for obvious reasons. So it is happening, but it's happening slowly. Uh, next question. Okay. Um, sorry. So, sorry. Can we use machine from Goran? Can we use machine learning to make sure the output is correct by feeding only correct data? It's not a data problem. I mean, yes, obviously, if you have the data is wrong, then your output's going to be wrong. But in the example that I showed you, the data was correct. Um, so it's not the output is wrong, not because the data is wrong, but because the neural models make mistakes. And that's, yeah, I mean, yes, if the data is flawed, you get a lot more mistakes. But even if data is perfectly correct, you will still get mistakes in these end to end neural models. Hey, would, would that be a use case for a post processor, though, in this sense, if we was assuming the data is correct, right? And so this would be a hybrid where, uh, you know, it could be generated with a neural net and then use using our post processors and the data models we have now, we can validate it. So that could be an approach because the data would technically be correct. Yeah, Hard. I mean, and so in, in principle, we've actually looked into this. Can we like, have some kind of human automatic post-processing, but there's so many mistakes, at least at the moment, it's, it's, it's not a good approach, but, but it might be in the future, you know? Because remember, it, it's the numbers are wrong. So it, it's, um, it, it's, it's, if I may just share my screen for a minute, right? So, yeah. So if you look at the example that, you know, that Craig did, right? It's, you know, the number, you know, very simple numbers like five to two rather than five to zero, you know, Monday rather than Wednesday. So it, there's a lot of mistakes and some of them are subtle, like playing the wrong team, but some are just very crude, like the numbers being wrong or the names being wrong. And that's correcting the data. So it's just the model struggles to deal with it. Um, let me think. So, so yeah, so data, I mean, you, you, you can't have a model where you generate a flawed narrative and then you fix it up automatically and with people. Um, but I think it's, it's not, there's too many mistakes to make that cost effective at the moment, but in the future, who knows? The technology is always getting better. What I would say lastly on this, and I've always thought, and 
I don't know if it's it's uh, worthwhile exploring, but I've always thought that we in generating this content as we do, right? Sports content, NLG based content. Uh, in generating this content, we have the language models, we have the data, and then we have the output. So we're in fact creating a corpus with data to back it up. Um, some, some, someone could pro come in and using all that data, uh, maybe uh, train a different model uh, to be more correct. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's uh, a useful use of time, but it could be possible theoretically. Yeah, no, 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 people have tried that kind of thing and it helps, but there's still a remaining problem. But yeah, it certainly helps for sure. Um, cool. So let me think. Uh, Goran also says Google is looking into building a universal language model that would support a thousand languages. This could be, um, yeah, I mean, so the question of languages is, is a good one because if you look at most data text work, it's mostly in English. There's actually much more in English than in any other language, which is not great. It'd be much better to have good text coming out in all kinds of languages, including you know ones that are perhaps less widely spoken. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think if we can really get these, you know, the the neural models working well, then one of the great advantages should be that we get it out in lots of languages, and so. Hopefully that will happen in the future. Um, it would be exciting anyway. Um, I think next one is for you, Jorge. Okay, can sports narratives be produced real time? For example, if someone is not watching a football game and they want to read about what's happening live. Yes, absolutely. And this is the exciting bit. Um, uh, with, with access to the official data feeds for football, and access to the live data feed, uh, we can create real-time language models. Um, and we can combine them with our data science models that do the uh, sort of like the, the analysis on, on the what's relevant and what's not. Um, and this, those are the same models, by the way, that we use to create the you know, long form content. We could easily use it to create live short form content to say, you know, player X is, hit you know six out of six shots tune in or we could identify a game sort of like automatically that's in the red zone um uh, yes yeah the, the answer is yes it's very exciting and it's something we're actively working on okay i think so i think next one's about the style of the text, I think that was more for you. Yeah, we do. So, um, and I don't know if it helps, does it help to read them or is it, uh, is everyone just- uh, now go, go ahead and please read the questions. You actually yeah. talked a bit about style stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah, so is it possible to tweak the style of the text, which I guess is a dimension independent from the facts described in by the text. Say the text could be emphatic as uh, if described by a fan after winning a game or like cold and bitter for a loss, far away from journalistic description. Yes, absolutely, and it's something, something we've done and it's something we, depending on the client, something that's required, to be honest. So uh, we have clients that want really dry um, AP style content that doesn't take a side. Uh, we have clients that can't take a side and so, or rather need to take a side because they have teams, say it's a conference, right, a sports conference. Um, they want to sort of defend their teams and maybe it's an out of conference team. They don't want to be so nice to them, um, or, or say, yeah, like the example of uh, a, a fan's favorite team. Um, we would want to do a game recap with the perspective of that team, and the opponent would be the other, uh, as opposed to saying team one, team two. Uh, absolutely. Can I uh, let me. Interp uh, interpolate a question here. Uh, are you all getting into vocalization of the generated text? In other words, you might put out annotations that could be used by a speech engine that would uh, have stylistic uh, uh, emphasis, pacing, things like that in a vocalization. You getting into that? Yeah, so this would be much more applicable in the live. Uh, I think because being so ephemeral, the live, like 
you know, I'm thinking of like a big play and there's a lot of exclamation points, right? Like that's, uh, um, it's, it's really the use case. I, I have a harder time seeing the use case in a, a post facto or even like a game preview. Um, but yeah, in the live, absolutely. And also Aria does that in some of its other use cases, like for example, in some of the financial stuff, we can actually speak it out if people won't speak it out. So um, yeah, so so we do vocalization. Oh, literally, yeah, literally vocalizing, yeah. 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 Speech, a uh, uh, text to speech, yeah. Okay, this is about template. Let me answer this one. So, yeah, I mean, it all depends what you're trying to do. Sometimes. Right, sorry, would you would you please read the question or summarize okay. it? So the question is: Thanks for the presentation. I have a quick question. Diversity in the generated content is not a requirement. Task evaded text compatible with templates, right? Or is there much? Right. And sometimes they're appropriate, sometimes not appropriate. So they're not good or bad. They work in some cases, but not others. Um, I think they work best when it's a quite a simple use case. Um, when the distance from, we, we talk about the distance from the data to the text, right? So when the data is very close to the text, when there's not much variation, when it's overall a relatively simple use case, yeah, it could work. Uh, when you have to do a lot more data analysis, when there's variation, when you want longer text, right? Not just the, then maybe templates don't work so great, but yeah, all I can, what you're trying to do. Yeah, real quickly, I think you, you absolutely put it in the question, right? If diversity in the generated content is not a requirement, then absolutely. And I would say actually, so um, this is sort of like an opportunity to talk about the, the, the tool, um, uh, of Aria Studio, uh, uh, sort of like the, the the tool that we use or can use, uh, uh, you can license it to to generate NLG. Uh, there's two options. There's the really nuanced JSON-driven project approach, which really interlaces many different data sources. It's very flexible. Uh, and then there's the tried and true table-based program a uh, uh, project, right? And you have all the data points you need at row level, and you describe each row. And that's all you want, and you don't have to overcomplicate things if that's really all you need. So I think that's a good question. Looking ahead at uh, so, to what extent is an uh, ontology knowledge base in, uh, implicitly encoded in the language model? Do you have an external ontology knowledge base? That's an excellent question. So, so right now the knowledge base, as it exists, it's really in two places. Um, one is in the data models we have in pre-processing, right? Can you identify a streak? Uh, can we put that in, uh, in, a, in a prioritized list, but then select it uh, via the language model? Uh, and two is the conditions uh, in the language model. Those are the two sort of uh, ways we reflect a knowledge base. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Um, is it possible to make for betting process? Uh, absolutely, um, that, that is a huge uh, growth area for us. Um, and, and, you know, the, the possibilities, you know, we get very excited. Um, and, and I think in terms of the success and the, or the simplicity of the solution, you can get really integrated with a sports betting provider and uh, you might actually uh, get user or, or uh, use user betting data, like, like in the example, uh, user X bet on this team, how do they do? Or, hey, user X uh, bets this way often. Can we give them a blurb about how often that is successful and maybe some other analytics around that? Um, yeah, there's, it's ripe uh, for, for uh, creative solutions here in the betting space. Challenge five, avoiding repetition. How is that achieved? There's only a finite way you can say certain things, especially in soccer, for instance, where zero zero is a frequent result. Uh, absolutely. How do you make that sound different each time? Um, let's see. 
Oh, and so so I just expanded it and there's sub comments. Um, I don't know, Seth, if it's useful to read those or I do yeah, want to- Why, why don't you- uh, but why don't you just go straight to your response? Uh, you know, you can touch on whatever's in the comments if you wish. Yes. Okay. So, so yeah, this is a very exciting uh, uh, question and, and and so appropriate, uh, especially given uh, you know global football, right? Uh, zero zero is very um, uh, very common, uh, and so how else can we tell the story to differentiate it? Um, I'll tell you two things. One. This connects back to um, challenge one, which is in the data and particularly the historical data. So what we try to do in creating a language model is, is first, and so analytics-based company, word number one, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna try to analyze the data. And so if we have you know, results going back to 1996, for example, we're gonna know the occurrence rate for zero, zero outcome. Uh, we're gonna know the occurrence rate for every outcome. And, and so we can go into comparing or, or using the historical data and outcomes, we can go into our language model uh, and come up with analytics to know how often each, you know, down to the phrase is, uh, is gonna appear in the text. Um, and so using that data, we can sort of fill in the gaps and add variation where there's a higher occurrence rate and maybe focus less on very low occurrence rate scenarios. Um, but the basic answer to, to your question is identifying those high occurrence rates and just like using edit editors to creatively uh, come up with, with text and also trying to go one level deeper in finding another slice to those zero, zero outcomes. Um, because maybe they were, you know, uh, you know, I can tell you right off the bat, we have scenarios for uh, low uh, volume shots on goal to high volume shots on goal. Um, you know, high foul rates where maybe it was testy. Uh, it, you can go on and on, but that, that's where really, that's where a subject matter expert uh, on the editorial side can help the, um, the technical side of creating the conditions to come up with a, a good solution. Okay, can I just add something? I see. Stephen has a comment, NLG is whatever we define it to be, it doesn't have to be DL based, et cetera. So I just, to me, the heart of NLG, I know this is a technology forum and I appreciate it, but the, the, the questions that worry me the most are not the technology, but what do people want? What is a good use of language? What's the data like? How do we evaluate and test it? So. The hard questions to, to me and the hardest questions are not really about technology, but about these, these other issues. Of course, technology is important, but you know, the questions of requirement, like any software, requirements, evaluation, testing, data issues, support are often the biggest headache. So Next question from Goran. Can NLG be used to do reverse output, take text in and generate data? Um, for example, could we use speech to text software, show NLG AI to pick up X amounts of... Um, um, Good forum. This is a technical NLP uh, uh, meetup, right? Uh, focusing yeah. on NLP. So I think text to data is, is NL, natural language understanding, not language, not language yeah. generation. So you can certainly can do it. Obviously, information extraction is all about taking information out of text. And there's lots of people who have great systems to do information extraction, but I wouldn't call it NLG. Um, I think next one is for you, Jorge, I think. Carrying it further, are you able to analyze individual frames in a video? You can come up with game strategies which might provide more commercial uh, outcomes. Um, if I think I understand what you mean. So yeah, coming, our roots really are uh, and doing this for coaches um, and then also for media um, coming up with, you know, analytics based on these scenarios. Um, I would say, yeah, for, for some sports, uh, a lot more than others. Uh, the example I showed was in basketball, but American football might be the best use case for this just because of the lineup 
um, the, the line formations. Um, but yeah, absolutely. All right, I'll take the next question. I don't get how energy does mistakes with figures, bigger or smaller. I find that interesting, especially seeing the outputs of GPT-3. So, so one of the problems with language model, and this is they're actually getting better, right? But traditionally, one of the problems with the large language models was they could not do arithmetic. It was just hopeless. So, so anytime you had data, you went to any kind of calculation, even adding, adding up numbers, seeing what's bigger, 90 or 100, they're just really bad. At, again, it's changing, they're getting better. But, you know, it's not, the language models can be amazingly bad at anything having to do with reasoning with numbers. Uh, but as I said, it's getting better, but it's, 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 pre, it's been pretty bad. Uh, question, are there open source code? Um, so I should say ARIA's software is not open source. Um, it's all proprietary. Um, I think there are other energy packages that are open source. But I think, Seth, did you say one of your sponsors did Rosa NLG? Was that right? Uh, no, I didn't say a sponsor did NLG. Uh, no. Okay, okay. Anyway, yeah, I mean, there are some open source packages out there. Um, in fact, I have a personal blog, and uh, which you can find on my website. I once wrote a blog about open source NLG, so you can look there if you're interested. Uh, but yeah, it's it's the ARIA stuff is, is not open source. Is your technology expensive? <laughs> it's a great question. It's a great follow-up to that question. Uh, you know. It, so the applications really, I don't know how to best say this. I, I think there are, depends on the use case and it, it's always gonna depend, depend on the use case, right? Um, it just so happens that the target market, um, you know, that, that we are currently familiar with our, our large organizations because uh, this is, you know, I'll tell you the, in, in AHOOD, you could really speak to this, but like, the market really has gotten more and more comfortable with NLG generated content in the last few years, but it wasn't always the case. And then you go back to like, is it right? Or is the technology there even at the enterprise level? Um, and I think it's a, it's, it's a hard project to solve. I think part of the cost comes in with the customer requirements being very specific. Or in our case, like we provide a real-time service, which has inherent costs, right? Um, so, so yes, uh, I would say unfortunately yes. But if, like Ehud said, if you do some um, research there on the, the open source community, I think there are options. Yeah, if I can just add in, if I look at again, Aria more broadly, right? So more broadly, Aria sells effectively apps, products, as well as toolkits. So I think if you want to use ARIA's toolkits to build your own system, it can require a certain level of expertise and investment. Um, some people find it easier than others, but you know, in the business intelligence space, ARIA also has apps that you can just you know pay for as you use them. So you pay as much as you use them. This one's for you, Ayud. Right. It seems like the errors from neural language models are because of their inability to control complex numerical operations. Do you think data text generation operations should be performed by non-neural models? So, yeah, I mean, I remember having, again, with my PhD students working in this space, we had some really good discussions about could we solve a lot of these problems by simply pre-calculating, you know, the averages, who won the game, all this kind of stuff. So the input of the model was not the raw numbers, but we added a layer of interpretation abstractions to it. Um, or in a sense, remember I talked about energy pipeline. So what we could do is we do the data side of the pipeline outside of the model, outside of the language model, and just compute all the insights and the numbers. And then once we have that, we then 
run a model to actually do the text. But I think that, again, even if you do that, you still get errors. So that helps, but you still get mistakes because the models still make, again, it, we can reduce mistakes by doing this and by doing other things that have been suggested, but you still get quite a few mistakes, even if you take, even if you do this and the other things that people have uh, described, unfortunately. Okay. Oh, and there's one, okay, one last one for ACO is real time narrative possible due to latency of large language models. Okay, so, so, so when we talk about language models, we're not using things like GPT 3, right? We're using much simpler things, right? Which we can do in real time. I, I think if you want to do use something like GPT 3 or Bloom, um, it's a serious challenge to do it in real time. I know people are working on it and there's models and people coming out with fast versions of these. Um, but yeah, I, I, it is a challenge if we want to use the large language models uh, in real time, that is, that is an issue. Yeah, and I got to answer really quick on the real timeness of the model. So you can imagine a game, right? And we have a live data feed of the events. All right, so we can use the events to create a box for, for whatever sport, and then we package those, uh, that, that data uh, to the language model. And so that's gonna trigger scenarios. And it's kind of, you know, unfortunately kind of simplistic in that way, but if something happens that triggers a condition, you're gonna see something, uh, a, a comment in response. So um, it, it, it would be in effect live. Matter of fact, it might be faster than broadcast, which is something we have to account for because of the delay. Well, uh, very good. Uh, oops, hit that twice. Very good. Uh, given the time, I think we're going to quit here rather than my inviting anyone else to add more questions. And uh, so thank you very much, Jorge and uh, Hood, for uh, the presentation. Uh, so um, it's really interesting.